This morning's scripture reading will be from 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verses 30 through 33. I'll be reading from the ESV version. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites, all the people both great and small. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord, to walk after the Lord, and to keep his commandments, and his testimonies, and his statutes, with all his heart and all his soul, and to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. Then he made all who were present in Jerusalem and in Benjamin join it, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers, And Josiah took away all the abominations from all the territory that belonged to the people of Israel, and made all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God all his days. They did not turn away from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. The beginning of the chapter of 2 Chronicles 34, the Bible says Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. Verse 2 reads, he did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Had he walked in the ways of his father Amon, he would have not been seeking God as we're told that he did. In verse 3, for in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still a youth, he began to seek the God of his father, David. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the ashram, the carved images, and the molten images. If you drop down to verse number 14, the Bible says, when they were bringing out the money which had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. He then gives it to Shaphan, who then reads it to Josiah, And Josiah makes a commitment, recommitment to God. The book had been lost in the temple. It's an interesting thing when you stop and think about it, how wonderful this must have felt for Josiah to read it. The Bible tells us other places there in 34 that he he humbled himself when hearing all of these things that had been written for them to follow. He humbled himself and made a, a commitment, a rededication of himself and then the children of Jerusalem, uh, the children of Israel in Jerusalem to follow after God. Repaired the temple, brought it back to what it needed to be. And not only that, he purged the entire land. He did this for 10 years. He said in the eighth year, he began to seek God and he started purging the land. And in the 18th year, he then started repairing the house of the Lord. So for 10 years, he went throughout the land, purging it of all the false gods, all the the idols, all the things where they burned incense to these false gods. He began purging the land. When we stop and think about this and the significance of this and how we can look at it and understand and learn how we should cherish the Bible. But if we're not careful, the Bible can become lost in our lives. It is not that some new Bible has been found that this sermon is about, but rather how we need to cherish the Bible that God has given us, the very words of God. And we're going to look at some things where if we are not careful in our lives, the Bible can become lost in our lives as well, as it did in the children of Israel, and they turned to things that were not the God of heaven which also tells us that if we are going to worship God as we should, if we are going to serve God as we should, if we're going to live for him as we should, we must be getting the instructions that are correct and right. And those are the instructions found 
in his holy Bible. If we are not careful, the Bible can become lost in our homes. We either use the Bible in our home or it can become lost there. Look with me at 2 Timothy, beginning in chapter 1. The Bible says in verse 5, Paul, writing to this young man, says, For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I am sure that it is in you as well. Later he would write in 2 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 14, he says, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and have become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy knew what it was he was to do, even as a young person. But those things would lead him throughout his entire life, not just through his youth, but through his entire life. In Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, we're given instructions of how our family lives are to be. Paul writing to us, the inspired writer says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, before, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Notice the next phrase, though. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Some translations say admonition. What does that mean? It sounds wonderful. Bring them up in the Lord. What does that mean? What does that mean? Do not provoke your children to anger. How do your children view you, fathers? Are you this dictatorial Law enforcer, rule enforcer, or are you a loving, caring father to them? One that welcomes them to come and talk to them. That wants to know what's going on in their lives. That everything out of your mouth is not correction or discipline, but encouragement. And the things that would look, have them look to God... Josiah was not, brought, was not brought up in that way. And yet he began to seek God as a youth when he was about 16 years old, the Bible tells us. His father was not a good example to him. Many of the men that I minister to on a daily and weekly basis will have said to me many times over the years, through the years of doing prison ministry, they'll say, if I had had scripture in my life as a young person, I know things would have been different. Or if I had taken scripture seriously, I know things would have been different. Josiah took things seriously of God and began to seek those things. And look what was found, the law that had been lost. If we are not careful, we can lose the teaching of God in our lives, in our homes. Fathers, mothers, it's our responsibility, it's your responsibility to teach your children. Amon had forgotten the things that he was to teach Josiah. But fortunately, Josiah found those things anyway. If we are not careful, it will be lost but let's be sure that it is found daily in our homes. Let's be sure that our children are brought up in the instruction of the Lord because it's read. And they see you reading it. They see you talking about and hear you talking about God and about the things of God and the things of His Son, Jesus Christ. And living as you teach. Let's bring them up in the instruction of the Lord, which is more than just telling them, but living that for them also. Next, if we're not careful, the Bible can become lost in the pulpits of churches around the world. If the Bible is not preached, what happens? Well, in the time of Josiah, what had happened is they turned to all the other gods that the world had to offer. There are all these false gods, the children of Israel... God's chosen people 
turn to false gods. If we're not careful and we do not demand from our preachers, our ministers, that God's word is what needs to be preached, it can become lost. There are too many pulpits this morning that will be filled with those who do not even refer to the scriptures. Maybe a scripture is mentioned, maybe God is mentioned, but the Bible is not preached as God would have it to be. And if it's not preached, all will be lost. We need to look to scriptures like 1 Corinthians 9, 16, where Paul said, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Again in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus. In 1 Timothy 4, 16, he says, Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in, in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation, both for yourself and for those who hear you. Peter would write, Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things, in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Would it be, and it would be, so great that if every pulpit this morning Throughout the world of the Lord's church is preaching the word to glorify God. If we are not careful, the Bible can become lost there. Next, if we are not careful, the Bible can also become lost in emotionalism. A faith better felt than taught is what the world would have you to believe, and much of the religious world would have you believe this as well. It's what you feel in your heart that's most important. It's, don't worry about what doctrine is or what is taught in the Bible. What do you feel? Do you feel the presence of God? These type of things are being told and taught to others. Instead, we need to turn to God's word. Jesus would say in John 6, 44 to 45, listen to him carefully. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Again in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, he says, It was for this he called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Titus 2, beginning in verse 11, this is a most interesting passage about the grace of God. Grace is absolutely necessary for our salvation. But listen to how we are to understand that grace. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. What was Titus to teach them about grace? That it appeared, that it gave us instruction of how to live correctly? Let me suggest to you that God sending Jesus is a manifestation of the grace that he has for us. Without Jesus coming to this earth, we could not be a redeemed people. He could not have us for a, a people of his own possession. We could not have salvation without 
God's grace. But if Titus is told to speak and exhort and reprove with all authority, what would be the reason for that if grace only was what we needed? Why would Titus need to do that? Why would Titus, Paul tell Titus it appeared bringing instruction so we would know how to live? Why would we need instruction if grace were the only thing we needed? Grace is necessary, absolutely, without the favor of God. We could not have a chance of salvation, but we must listen to the instructions. Faith only is not something that can save us. We must listen to the instructions and then start doing what the instructions say. What is that? Well, it's denying the things of this world. It's denying things against God and therefore embracing the things of God. But if the Bible's not taught, the Bible is not what we turn to. To have those instructions, it becomes lost in how we feel and how we think. In Galatians 5, 22 to 25, the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Now I put this in here because we start looking at those things of the fruit of the Spirit and we think, well, some of those are emotions. I have to feel those things. Absolutely you do. But notice that he says you take away the passions and worldly desires. Those things are contrary to what God wants you to do. And so he's teaching us these emotions are things you should have and these attributes are things you should have in your life. But it's not that you just have these emotions and these feelings. You put away the things of the world and you begin taking on the things of God, the things of Christ. And that Bible is not lost in emotionalism, but you embrace the teaching and it brings a joy and contentment unlike anything else you could ever feel with the things of this world. We need to not have the Bible lost, but have a faith built upon the Word of God as our foundation, as our go-to. What does God say about this? What did Jesus teach about this? And look for those things. Next, if we're not careful, we can have the Bible being lost and just unconcerned. No desire to know what God wants us to have. That's just another book. In fact, it's such an old book, it's just not relevant to today's world. That's what the world would have you to believe. It's what the devil wants you to do, is to lose the teaching in the Bible. He wants it to be lost in your life. But God wants you to embrace it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul gives the example of the children of Israel and how they would turn away from God. They would follow God and then they would turn away from God. And they would follow God and they would turn away from God. The reading that you had a moment ago in 2 Chronicles 34, Josiah, during the time of his lifetime, the time of his reign, the children of Israel did not turn away from the God of heaven, neither to the right or to the left. They stayed focused. They had their mind set on doing the things of God because they had found the law of Moses once again as they were restoring the house of God. Hilkiah the priest found it and brought it to Shaphan who brought it to Josiah who humbled himself before these words. He was, he was seeking God, but he didn't have the direction, the instructions. He knew that he had to get, do away with these old gods, these gods that his father had been worshiping. And so he turns to his faithful father, his forefather David, and he turns to that God and begins seeking him, knowing I've got to get rid of all these false gods, but then the law is found. And Josiah's happy about that. 
1 Corinthians 10, as Paul is giving all of these things that the children of Israel did, he said, now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Let me pause there for a moment. That's an interesting phrase. When Paul's talking to these Christians, he's like, the end of the ages have come. Whoa, is the world about to end, Paul? That's not what he's saying. He's saying, you're in the last days. This is it. There's not going to be any other ages. What does that mean? God is not going to reveal something that is different than the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's not going to bring anything new to us. You are in the last dispensation, if you will. The last age of what God is going to allow this earth to exist under is the Christian age. And we would do well in order to embrace that idea and understand there's not a new revelation coming. This is the complete word of God as revealed to us by him. And he wants us to study it. He does not want it to become another book. He doesn't want us to be unconcerned about the teaching in there. He goes on to say in verse 12, Therefore, listen to him now, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Don't get so complacent in your Christianity, in your walk with God in, in Christ, that you think, I can't fail. We've got to humbly bow before him every single day and understand that by the grace of God, I have been given another day in order to serve him properly. And I need to treat that day as such and not be unconcerned about living the life that God would have me to live, that Jesus would have me to live. Don't be unconcerned about that saying, well, I can, I can do that tomorrow. Today, I'm going to do what I want to do and how I want to do it. It doesn't matter what God says. That's unconcerned. Thinking, I've got time, I can make it right tomorrow, I can make it right in a year, five years from now, I'm just, just five more years. If you've never obeyed the gospel, you're showing unconcern for the Bible. If you've never obeyed the gospel, essentially God's word is lost in your life. There was a church... It was written to in Revelation 3, Laodicea. And Jesus, talking to them, says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Was Jesus talking about physically these things? No. He was talking about their spiritual attitude and their spiritual life. Paul says, take heed unless you fall. What are you falling from? God's grace. You're falling from a right relationship of God. Jesus said, you think that you're so great, you Christians in Laodicea, and you're not hot and you're not cold. You're just trying to get by, trying to do what you think is right, and you don't understand your state. And Jesus says, you're making me, you're making me, you're making me sick because of your attitude. And if we're not careful, we can become unconcerned with how we're living our life. And the Bible's lost. In Hebrews 2, 1 to 3, he says, For this reason we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. 
What's the Hebrew writer telling us? I gotta be concerned about my spiritual state. I can't get to a point where I'm not thinking about that any longer. I'm never going to reach that area of Christianity where I don't have to be concerned about my spiritual welfare. If I do, I'm neglecting the salvation that I stand in. And if I'm not a Christian, I'm neglecting that salvation that God's offered to me. In Mark 8, 36 to 38, Jesus said, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words and this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. What's Jesus saying? Don't be so concerned with the things of this world. None of those things will bring you salvation. None of those things will allow you to stand in a right relationship with God. And if you get to the point where those things are the things you're more concerned about than the things of God, you've lost the Bible in your life. Instead, we need to understand and embrace that the Bible gives the whole purpose of what I'm here for. The Bible gives me everything that I need to be pleasing to God. And I should never desire to not read it and know it. Next, if we're not careful, the Bible can be lost in sensationalism. The focus on worldly things and man-made things and listening to what man says reading books of self-help books and what is the latest and greatest trendy thing to do when it comes to trying to live this life the way that I should. Instead, we need to be focusing on what God says. This is not something new. People have been listening to other people on this earth for, since man has been here. In Acts 8, beginning in verse 9, it says there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, this man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. In 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 18, Paul said, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Foolishness of God. Isn't that an interesting twist that God, that Paul gives us there? Man looks at the foolishness, or the wisdom of God as foolishness. But as God looks at it, it's not, certainly. We should begin looking at it as what it is, the wisdom of God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, beginning in verse 1, And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of man, but on the power of God. Paul knew that the Bible the words of God should not be lost. He knew this so strongly that as he was writing to the church in Galatia, they had been turning to things they were hearing from men. 
and turning away from the gospel that had been preached to them. In verse 1 of chapter 6 of Galatians, he says, I'm amazed. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Paul is introducing this idea to the Galatians that the things they're hearing from men are not the things that are of God. They are something entirely different. But if we focus on what man has created as far as religion goes, we have lost the biblical teaching that God would have us follow, would have us read, would have us obey. And so we must understand that the Bible should not be lost in this manner. Instead, we need to be grounded in sound doctrine of the Bible. As we begin to bring the lesson to a close, I'd like us to understand that in our lives as Christians, as followers of God, we should never look at the Bible as anything except the Holy Bible, the Word of God and the Word of God only. We need to treasure it as that, the very words of God, and humbly look to it and understand the grace that God has given us by allowing us to see what he would have us to do. The grace that God has given us so that we can stand in a right relationship with him, not floundering in this world wondering, well, how can I be pleasing to God? In the text that I chose as the inspiration for this lesson, 2 Chronicles 34, they didn't have the Bible any longer, the law, the Word of God, and so they were turning to other things. Would it be that we would always turn to God's Word for guidance and never allow the Holy Bible to become lost in our lives? 2 Timothy 2, 14 and 15, he told Timothy, Paul told Timothy, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words which is useless, leads to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. In Luke 11, an interesting passage there, there's a woman in the crowd that cries out, blessed is the womb that bore you. And Jesus corrects her in verse 28. But he said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. Did Jesus not love his mother? Of course he did. You may recall as he hung on the cross seeing her and committing her care to the one that he loved, the Apostle John. What he was saying is following God's word is the most important thing that we can do. In Psalms 119, beginning in verse 37, the psalmist would write, Turn my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in your ways. Establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence for you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your ordinances are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it, 
you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. You see the passage at the top of the screen, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that says all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate or complete, equipped for every good work. You want to do right in the sight of God? Turn to his holy word. If you want to be in a right relationship with God, assured of your salvation, turn to God's word for guidance. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17 tells us. We have to know what God says in order to develop a faith, understanding that it's by the grace of God that he gave us this holy word. But that grace appeared, instructing us. And so we must listen to it. Never allow the Bible to become lost in our lives. If you've not found God's word, and by that I mean by being obedient to it, if you've not found that, we stand right to help you this morning. We stand right here waiting for you to come forward and make it known that you want to obey the Bible in the way that God has prescribed for it to be obeyed. And if you're here this morning and you have obeyed God's word, you are, you're, you are a Christian, but you have lost, allowed the Bible to be lost in your life. My hope and desire is that you make a recommitment to the Bible, that it is found daily in your life in some way, that you study it to know what God would have you to do and then put those things in your life so that as people come into contact with you, there's no question in their mind and in your mind that you are a follower of God, that you are a disciple of Christ, that you are a Christian. If you have any need in any way, please, please don't leave here today without being right in the sight of God. Come now while we stand and sing.